Okay, yeah, there should be sound now. All right, um, bear with me one second. Way busy, hi, can you hear me? Testing, mic check. Okay. Um, you have no sound. Can you try to refresh again, leave the room and come back? Can you, John, can you tell him to leave the room and come back again? Hold on, let me type it. I think John can hear me, so. All right, the name of the study tonight, I was going to name it Receiving a Kingdom, but I think it's probably more of, yeah, Leave Pal Talk again. It might be more appropriate to, uh, to label this study Receiving No Kingdom, because that's the topic I think we're going to be looking at here receiving no kingdom which I, I'm gonna propose tonight uh, this appears to be talking about the time when the believers came into the great tribulation and tonight's study is uh, beginning a series on the ten horns a very complicated uh, subject area so we're gonna have to take time and uh, break it down to try to see uh, if we can develop uh, consistency there in some other language. Loving hi, welcome to the room. Okay, uh, receiving no kingdom. Revelation chapter 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. Is this a born-again Christian room? Well, by God's grace, we believe that we're born again. Uh, There's really no way of telling if someone is born again. You just have to uh, sit back, Lord willing, and listen to the uh, what's being offered. And as Bereans, oh, okay, as Bereans, you check it out in the Bible. No, no, not a problem. <clears throat> uh, the main goal of this room is really to try and be faithful to uh, <clears throat> to the Bible going into the scriptures as Bereans and making sure that these things are so and even there we are still dependent on God the Holy Spirit to uh, reveal truth okay so Revelation chapter 17 verse 12 the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with the beast what is this talking about? Are the ten horns associated with the believers or the unsaved? Is this the language of judgment? You know, as I said, uh, when we look at the beast, the very fact that we read about the ten horns being on the beast or being a part of the beast, we tend to uh, get the impression that God is talking about someone other than myself. In other words, he's talking about the unsaved, but we've looked at some other language in the book of Revelation that seems to relate the believers to the unclean body prior to the separation of wheat and tares. And so it's not, it wouldn't be surprising to see that a God there is talking about the believers at the time when they are said to be identified with the unclean. And now God is going to bring them out of Babylon. So what's interesting in this verse is that we understand that coming into the Great Tribulation is when Antichrist are ruling, right? Antichrist, uh, Antichrist are ruling. And so it doesn't seem to relate that Satan would not be receiving a kingdom. Does that make sense? But the believers, because they had to wait for a, uh, the appointed time, then when Christ is revealed, they come to receive. They receive the kingdom. Now take a look at verse 13. These have one mind, and we'll talk about this one mind in another study. We have to analyze that separately, Lord willing. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Luke chapter 4 verse 36. 
they were all amazed and sp spake among themselves saying what what a word is this but with authority and power now the word power and strength or authority usually it is pointing to Christ God also speaks of the beast that is the kingdom of Satan receiving uh, power and authority so we have to look at the context uh, carefully Lord willing to see whether or not uh, we can actually relate them to the believers or the unsaved. In this context, I believe God is talking about the, the believers, the elect. They forfeit, they give, they surrender power and strength unto the beast until the word of God would be fulfilled. So it's the same uh, phrase we're looking at here. With authority and power, he commanded the unclean spirits. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together <clears throat> and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. Now that's what I was talking about just now. There is that portion of authority and power that could also relate to the unsaved church. But it still identifies with Christ. Christ is ultimately uh, the authority. He is the power. He gives a kingdom unto the beast in tribulation. And so the, uh, the word of God is trodden underfoot. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 22 who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels, and authorities, and powers being made subject unto him. That is Christ. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in, in heaven saying, Now is come salvation and strength. That's power. And the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. So that's what I was offering just now. It's at the revelation of Christ, it seems, Believers now, they receive a kingdom. They receive strength, power, as they come out of Babylon. The word of God is fulfilled, it seems, at the appointed time. Let's go back to Revelation 17, verse 17. God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. Still talking about the ten horns here, I believe. Give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So again, this seems to be the time, you know, God allows Antichrist to rule in the church. So the kingdom is trodden underfoot. Satan is ruling. He receives power and strength and authority. He receives the kingdom in tribulation. So it's kind of interesting that God speaks of the, the ten horns not receiving a kingdom. Can you see that? So this would seem to relate to the believers having to wait. How long, O Lord, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood? And that had to take place at the appointed time. At the appointed time. Uh, we read in... Uh, Revelation 10, verse 7. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, should be fulfilled. So I'm proposing here that the fulfillment of the word of God is looking at the appointed time. John writes, Matthew 5, 18. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Yes, amen, John. That's a very uh, good verse. I think it does relate, Lord willing. Thanks for sharing that. So there had to be a time. God had to allow all things that had been written to be fulfilled. And that would seem to be the case here. Revelation 20, verse 3. Uh, let's go back to verse 15. I'm sorry, Revelation 15, verse 1. And I saw another angel... Another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up. That's fulfilled. It's filled up. God is bringing all things to an end. 
once Christ is revealed. It's filled up the wrath of God. Revelation 20, verse 3. Cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should, uh, he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled. There again, a very complex verse. I think it's talking about the time when uh, Satan goes into perdition. Uh, and then after that, he is loose. He goes into perdition. He is loose a little season to destroy the church today. I believe that's what we see uh, going on. God is allowing Satan to uh, ravage the unsaved body. But before that, he was bound for a thousand years. Till a thousand years should be fulfilled. At the end of the thousand years, spiritually, now he is allowed to go after the rest of the body. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. When thou... Hold on one second. <clears throat> when the thousand years are expired. Same word. So again, it's at the time when God's word is actually fulfilled. Right? Whatever the time period uh, that's uh, ordained for uh, God's will to be done. When a thousand years are expired, fulfilled, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. That's the time, again, I propose that he goes into perdition to destroy the rest of the church. And so we see Revelation 6, verse 11. How long, O Lord? Right? Uh, and then there are two white robes. Uh, in verse 11, white robes were given unto every one of them. It's talking about the believers, right? They're killed in tribulation. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So God, it seems, had to wait for a precise time, the appointed time. That's the time when the word now is actually fulfilled. Uh, hold on, let me break up this verse that did not post. Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. And the other part. We read here, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters. He held up his right hand, his left hand unto heaven, swear by him that liveth forever and ever. It shall be for a time, times, and a half a time, when he shall have accomplished. It's talking about Antichrist again, I believe, the beast. When he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. All these things shall be fulfilled. All these things shall be finished. Luke 24 verse 44. And by the way, again, that's the time when the believers come into tribulation. Right? Daniel chapter 12 verse 7. In Luke 24 verse 44. These are the words which I spake unto you. While I was yet with you, all things, that all things must be fulfilled. Everything has to be fulfilled. Satan has to reign. Antichrist has to rule in the body prior to uh, judgment or prior to the separation. Luke chapter 1 verse 20. Behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak. Now, this is a very interesting uh, statement. You know, well, we read about Zechariah, I believe. Uh, he was in the temple, and then he received a vision about the birth of uh, John the Baptist. And then we read here, and I think God is using him as a picture of the believers. Picture of the believers coming into the Great Tribulation. They're dumb. They're not able to speak. Why? Because God has not yet given them the word to speak. When do they receive the word to speak? When do the believers receive the word to speak? Yeah, exactly, John. At the revelation of Christ, when the book is open. Now they're no longer dumb. Now they can speak. Isn't that interesting? So until these things should be fulfilled... Right, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Second Chronicles thirty six twenty one to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Now that's a number that identifies, I believe, with uh, the Great Tribulation. 
we're going to take a look at that in a few minutes. We'll try and break it down a little bit further and look at the number 84 as it relates to uh, the 70, uh, 70 years. Okay, uh, a few more verses. Lamentations chapter 2, verse 17. The Lord hath done that which he hath devised. He hath fulfilled his word. So when God brings judgment to the church, I propose this is when the word is fulfilled. Right? Job chapter 1, verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath, is in thy power. We're looking at Job here. Remember Job? Uh, he is afflicted. And he is a type or a picture of the believers in tribulation. God allows Satan to buffet him, right? Same thing with the believer. Because they're not receiving the word to speak, the book has not yet been opened. Now we can say that Job really is looking at the believers as God allows them to come into the great tribulation. To come into the great tribulation. And then what happens after that? He receives double, which would be a picture of salvation. So all that he have is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. And then in verse 6, Job chapter 2, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. Can you see that? So God allows the believers, typified by Job, to come under the uh, the authority of Antichrist and tribulation, but he is to spare his life. And that, I believe, has to do with the time when the believers, they come out of Babylon. And speaking of Babylon, we're going to look at that next, but take a look at Isaiah chapter 10, verse 6. I will send him against a hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down. Troddening down is the word of God. The Bible trampled underfoot under the feet of men. Again, that has to do with Antichrist ruling in the church. Right? In tribulation. So, I will give him a charge to take the spoil. So, Satan takes the spoil but then when Christ is revealed, God plunders his house. He has to uh, let the prisoners go free. Serving the king of Babylon. Again, a picture I think, uh, I believe in tribulation. Looking at the believers in tribulation. Jeremiah chapter 28 verse 14. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon thy neck, upon the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. You see, the believers, they have to be obedient. And this was a situation when God allowed you know, the wicked nation, uh, Babylon, to come into Jerusalem. Remember when uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away the, uh, the gold <clears throat> and all the, uh, the precious elements of the, uh, the temple and the people, he carried them to Babylon. God allowed them to do that, not by his own power, that was God's judgment on, on the people. And they had to be obedient. They could not resist. And it's through the obedience of the people of God, God now visits them at the appointed time, and then they begin to go back into, the, uh, uh, into their own land to rebuild. And there again would be a picture of the depart out. So, that they may serve the king of Babylon, and they shall serve him, and I have given him the beast of the field also. Everyone, all those in the church. Jeremiah 27, verse 11. But the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, those will I let remain in their own land. So again, that would have to be a picture of the believers, right? When God visits them. He brings back their captivity. Now they come into New Jerusalem. Jeremiah 27 verse 17. Hearken not unto them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. If you are disobedient, which I believe was uh, what the church was doing, 
Uh, they design their own gospels, their own salvation program. So in essence, they're not uh, putting their uh, necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon. And so God's judgment comes on them. So serve the king of Babylon and live. Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. There it is again. Now this king here is the, the king of Babylon. It is King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 38. And wherefore, wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, hath he given unto thine hand. God gives everything into the hand of Satan, king of Babylon, coming into the great tribulation until the word of God would be fulfilled. So that's why the believers now, I think, I believe, typified by the ten horns, were not receiving a kingdom because they had to be obedient they had to uh, be submissive to the king of Babylon. Daniel chapter 2 verse 44. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So there it is. In a time when Satan is ruling, the days of these kings, and God breaks them down into uh, the first, second, and third king. Uh, but I believe he is just giving us uh, different uh, aspects of the uh, the character of Satan ruling in tribulation, the fourth kingdom. We looked at the four uh, the fourth beast the last time. The number four having to do with universality, looking at uh, God's judgment on the whole church. So it's interesting here. We read, and the kingdom shall not be left to another or to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. That's when Christ is revealed, right? Now he destroys Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And John posted Revelation 17, verse 6, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore, and shall, burn her um, shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Yeah, that, that's a complex verse there, John. Uh, that's going to have to be a part of another series. That's a whole study in itself, Lord willing. So we'll, we'll come back to that as well. We've talked in the past about God judging Babylon from two sides. First of all, we, we understand the church destroys the church. The church commits suicide. And also God allows the believers. Fire comes out of their mouths. Also, they destroy the beast. They destroy Babylon. But we'll try to elaborate on that a little bit further uh, next time. Jeremiah 25 verse 11 And this whole land shall be a desolation and astonishment and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years 70 years and then we looked at this verse before we posted it again did not post bear with me 2 Chronicles 36 verse 21 to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah the prophet until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate and the land lies desolate when when does the land lie desolate in tribulation right in tribulation yeah it's also desolate today as God is judging Babylon but as long as the believers were a part of the church there was desolation as well. The believers were not yet receiving a kingdom. But when Christ is revealed, now he begins to separate them from the terrors. Long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Now, we understand that God intervened in the great tribulation. He intervened. Right? He cut the day short. In Luke chapter 14, verse 5, he answered and said, saying, He answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath? The Sabbath, I believe, identifies or typifies or is pointing to the Great Tribulation, a time when the church is supposed to uh, rest, but they're not resting in Christ, they're not keeping the Sabbath. 
But the Sabbath also identifies with the resurrection. Christ rose on the first of the week, the first day. That was a Sunday. On the first of, how does that go? Matthew 28, verse 1. And the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first of the Sabbath. See, God now, he introduces a new Sabbath, which was Sunday. But that, I believe, was pointing to the separation. And that's how we can actually, I believe, uh, tie in the word Sabbath to both the Great Tribulation as well as the, uh, the Revelation of Christ. Because at the Revelation of Christ, there is a... Um, at the Revelation of Christ, there is a resurrection. Okay, now, just as an aside, I just wanted to share this because I don't believe it's an accident. Uh, today we, we look back, Lord willing, at the calendar. Uh, and we've also said in the past that it's kind of interesting how it's today that the believers are uh, understanding time and judgment. So we, we see by God's grace that Christ has already been revealed. But take a look at the common denominator uh, with the number 7, 70 years, and the 23-year tribulation. The famine that came uh, on the land of Egypt in the time when Joseph was there, it was for 7 years. And the number seven is uh, can be factored into the uh, the number 84. 84 identifies with tribulation. 70 years captivity. The number 70 is there also. The number 12, three times four. 12 has to do with uh, the the fullness of the believers. 144,000 coming into the grip. I'm sorry, coming into the kingdom. The ceiling of the 144,000. And then we see the number 23, which also by itself is very common as it relates to judgment, tribulation. So there again, we see the number 3, the number 4, and the number 7. That's 8,400 days. See that? That's why I say, you know, uh, by God's grace, the calendar is accurate. It has to be accurate because otherwise then we, we wouldn't know what to do with all the time reference, time information that God gives us in the Bible. But as I said, we have to read the calendar in the light of, of the whole Bible. Otherwise, now we begin to use the calendar, uh, like some doing today, <clears throat> trying to determine the very last day. Okay, some more verses. The final section here, receiving a kingdom. That's the salvation side of it. When Christ is revealed, now the believers... They're no longer in tribulation. Now they come into the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 19, verse 15. It came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom. Then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he gave, he had given them, he had given the money. So there again, that's Christ, I believe. He is reckoning with the church. And this happens at the time when he receives the kingdom. Christ receives the kingdom. The believers too because they're not separated from Christ Christ is the head of the body the head cannot be separated from the body right so if Christ receives the kingdom then the believers also they are said to uh, come out of Babylon Revelation 1 verse 9 I John who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience now that's another element which is very important the believers had to wait Till the time, until the word of God would be fulfilled. So they had to wait patiently. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And it was told that they should rest until the word of God would be fulfilled. So it's the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation. Is that... An individual salvation? Does this mean that God now is going to save people today? Bring in additional uh, believers into the kingdom? Well, that, I propose, Lord willing, would not be consistent with the rest of the Bible. Because Revelation 7 speaks of 
the sealing of the 144,000 prior to God bringing the herd on Babylon. So if God is judging Babylon today, it would mean that the 144,000 have been sealed. So this salvation here, now has come salvation and strength. The word salvation means deliverance. God now is going to bring back the captivity of the believers. Why bring back their captivity? Well, because God had not yet brought about revelation. They didn't understand time and judgment and tribulation. Why? Because Antichrist were ruling. There was a lot of deception going on until God would begin to unseal the Bible and bring correction. So now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. Revelation 11 verse 15. Seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become. See, now that's the believers, I propose, receiving the kingdom. So now it, it appears to make sense that when we read about the ten horns, these are ten kings which have not received the kingdom. Well, that would seem to relate to the believers and tribulation. <clears throat> Mark chapter 10, verse 15. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child. The church doesn't receive the kingdom. They're not humble. They're not as little children. Remember, suffer the little children who come unto me. Of such is the kingdom. Um, almost done. Two more verses. This one didn't post. Daniel chapter 7 verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints. That has to be talking about the revelation of Christ, right? Shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. And then finally, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, and I think we read this before. Um, verse 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Yeah, we saw that verse earlier, but I just wanted to share it here again in the context of salvation. Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Satan can no longer attack the people of God. He has no hold on them. Why? Because God is bringing revelation to them. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. So all the prior kingdoms, Antichrist ruling and tribulation, these have been put down. Now, it doesn't mean that God is not allowing those who remain unsaved to be destroyed. Satan continues to destroy. The only difference, though, is that those that are coming out of tribulation... They receive the kingdom in a sense that God now uh, brings revelation to them. Okay, a very quick conclusion, and then we can open for a little bit of discussion. So the ten horns I'm offering here uh, one second. Bear with me. Okay. The ten horns not yet receiving a kingdom appears to be language of the elect and tribulation. Prior to the separation, they were to serve the king of Babylon till the appointed time. That is, until the word of God would be fulfilled. The time when all things written in the law would be fulfilled. Then comes judgment on Babylon as well as Redemption, salvation, right? And that salvation, again, I propose, it is God bringing back the captivity of his people. Okay. All right. Uh, bear with me one second. I'll be right back.